Okay, today we'll continue <coughs> with some of the questions left from left over from yesterday. <coughs> First question is why be so strict with Vedana? <coughs> Isn't it possible to enjoy your positive feelings without being attached to them? <coughs> The Vedana are the cause of losing the mind's naturalness. The mind's naturalness is lost due to the Vedana. The Vedana either lead to there being too much or not enough. And in this way, the mind's naturalness is lost. So, if one is to enjoy feelings, we must enjoy them in a way that does not lose the mind's naturalness, that does not disturb the natural balance of the mind. If the feelings are positive or negative, then that balance has already been disturbed. So to not lose that naturalness, one has to be above the positive and negative so that the positive and negative don't have any power to disturb the mind's naturalness. In Dhamma, or in the ways of investigating Dhamma, the absence of positive and negative feelings are, is still considered to be a feeling, the feeling that is neither positive nor negative. This is also a Vedana. And this Vedana is a way to help us get free of the positive and negative Vedana. And this then is a kind of happiness or contentment which is more subtle and far more refined than the positive kind of happiness. To live with the kind of Vedana which is neither positive nor negative is a far higher kind of happiness than with the positive kinds of feelings. The next question is, is one man's wise want another man's foolish desire? In general, this is not possible <clears throat> because there is wisdom and foolishness are not interchangeable like this. So when speaking of those who have natural or proper wisdom, then there is no way that this can be. However, if we're talking about people whose intelligence is abnormal, such as immoral people or criminal people, then this could happen because their, their intelligence and understanding is already abnormal and so such twists and perversions are possible. Next question. I experience anijang, so I understand it. I experience dukkha, so I understand it. I do not experience anatta. How can I know it and understand it? How to experience anatta? Regarding this subject, it's useful to consider that before the Buddha's time, there were quite a few 
people who understood the subjects of anichang, impermanence, and tukang, or dukkhaness. For example, the Buddha spoke of a teacher named Araka in a distant city who explained and taught impermanence as well as the Buddha himself. Now, it doesn't say in the scriptures where exactly this distant city is, but we think it might be Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, who taught Pantare, or all is flowing, everything flows, all is in flux. Um, Heraclitus lived at the same time as the Buddha, and one of his central teachings was that of impermanence. So perhaps this is who the Buddha was referring to. Anyway, this is just one example that before the Buddha's teaching, there, was, <clears throat> there were many people who knew about impermanence and dukkha but that anatta or not-self was another matter and it took the Buddha to, to make this known and still it's not so easy to understand. Impermanence and dukkha are relatively easy to understand but anatta is more difficult. So what one needs to do is to examine life, examine these bodies and minds to see how they just happen naturally, that everything just happens naturally according to the law of nature, that the body is a collection of sankharas, of conditioned, concocted things which, have, which arise and pass away, and that the mind is also nothing but a flow of sankharas, of concocted things which are concocted through conditions. They arise, perform some function, and then cease. That this is what's going on in life. This is just naturally what is taking place. And then when we watch the natural flow, of body and mind, <clears throat> we come to see how, how it is impossible to achieve desires. When we operate through the illusion of self, we think that it's possible to get what we want. But when we, if we look more deeply, we see that it's not possible to get what we want. And this is one, this is the first level of understanding not-self. To see that as these sankharas of mind and body flow onward, they don't listen to anyone. They don't follow the orders or commands of anyone. And so it's impossible for us to get what we want. To see this is one level of understanding anatta. Another way of understanding and experiencing not-self requires that you understand the law of itapajayata quite well. We have tried our best to help you and to encourage you to study and understand this law of itapajayata or the fact that everything happens dependent on conditions, on other things. When we see the facts of itapajayata both within us and around us, when we see that everything just happens through causes and conditions, then we, 
And when we see that things are itapajayata themselves and that they happen according to the law of itapajayata, then we see that things don't come according to our desires. Things happen according to the law of itapajayata, not according to our wants and desires. So the more we understand itapajayata, the more we will understand not-self. We just don't have the ability or power to control things so that they will happen the way we want them to happen because they're under the control of itapajayata. The body is itapajayata, the mind is itapajayata, and even if there was some soul which would die or experience the death of the body and then be reborn in some other body, then that such a soul would not be a self or atta it would merely be itapajayata. Such a belief in a soul that is reborn after death is a belief of other religions. It's not a belief in Buddhism. In Buddhism there is just itapajayata. Everything happens according to causes and conditions. There is no self or soul that goes and gets reborn. Buddhism teaches that everything absolutely is not self. Body and mind are not self. There's no self or soul that will be reborn after death. Therefore, if we wish to have something which is the highest power, which is above everything else and controls and directs everything, then that is itapajayata. This law of itapajayata is in control of everything. It's permanent and unchanging similar to what in other religions is called God. So even if we have some ultimate power or law, such as itapajayata, we don't consider that to be atta or self. In other religions, this highest power or principle is considered to be the ultimate self or something like that, to be some supreme atta or paramatman. But in Buddhism, it's all considered to be anatta, even itapajayata, even God, even if you wish to speak in terms of God, Buddhism will insist that God is not self. Even if we have some highest self, some traditions like to speak of the higher self, but no matter how high this self may be, we still take, insist that it is anatta or not self. Even the highest self is not self because it's merely itapajayata. No matter how high or sublime some self may seem, it merely happens according to causes and conditions and is therefore not self. If we have atta or self, then the thing which necessarily follows is ataniya or of self. 
once there is self, there are all the things of self or that belong to self. And then there are all these burdens. When there are things belonging to self, then there are all these things to burden and create problems for the self. So to not have any atta or antaniya, any self or of self, is to be free, to, to be released from all bondage, from all, from all burdens. This, this is much better. If this mind has atta, self, and atani, ataniya of self, then it carries a lot of burdens with it. This mind isn't free. It's not peaceful because of these burdens. This is because this world is, there are all kinds of things which affect and disturb the atta and ataniya. All these disturbances will then create problems for the self and that which is of self. And so the mind can never find any peace. But when the mind has no more atta or ataniya, then it is free, it's peaceful. There's nothing that can disturb it, limit it, or harm it. The mind which is free or void is the mind that perfectly knows or is enlightened to the fact that nothing is atta or ataniya. When the mind has thoroughly, completely, perfectly realized that all things are not self, that there is nothing which belongs to self, then this is the mind which is void. And this same mind has tremendous power. This mind that is free is no longer limited. And so it can be said to be almighty. The void mind is almighty or all powerful. And this is the mind which is emancipated. This is the meaning of salvation. Next question. If Nibbana is outside of the khandas, how can we know it? First one needs to understand that there are two aspects of nature. There are all the things which are sankata or conditioned, concocted things. All the things that can be affected, influenced, conditioned by things are called sankata. And then there is the asankata, the unconditioned, the unconcocted, that which cannot be touched, affected, influenced by, by anything. The five khandas, this mind-body, are sankata. Nibbana is asankata. Nibbana is that which cannot be conditioned, affected, or influenced. It's beyond all that. So the problem is how can the conditioned khandas come to experience the unconditioned? The answer is that the khandas must, or the mind here we can say, must be no longer concocted or conditioned. When the mind is not conditioned or concocted by anything, then it is able to experience that state which is beyond conditioning. 
when the mind is conditioned, concocted by things, then it, it's oblivious to the reality that is beyond concocting and conditioning. But when we can make the mind unconditioned, when we can free the mind from the conditioning and concocting of that we're all so used to, then it can experience Nibbana or the unconditioned. To speak in terms of a metaphor, we can say that Nibbana is everywhere, always. However, so Nibbana is omnipresent. But because our mind is covered with ignorance, the mind has no ability to experience or make contact with Nibbana. Therefore, one needs to free the mind of the defilements, free the mind of desire, free the mind of attachment, so that when the mind is thus emancipated from all concocting, then it will be able to experience the reality of that which is unconditioned, namely Nibbana. It's like a window or door. All you have, to, as long as the window is closed, the sunlight cannot come in. All you have to do is open the window and the sunlight will enter. You don't have to pull the sunlight in. Just open the window or open the door and it will enter by itself once we remove that which prevents it from entering. Next question is Atamayata Nibbana. Nibbana is the, or excuse me, Atamayata is the state of mind which makes it possible for the mind to experience Nibbana. When the mind is covered and enclosed by concoctions, then it cannot experience Nibbana. But when there is a Dhammayata, that is the state of mind which is unconcocted, unaffected, uninfluenced by anything. And this state of mind then is the one in which Nibbana can make contact. Nibbana can make contact with the mind which is not covered or enclosed. So therefore we do not say that Atamayata is Nibbana, but Atamayata is the state of mind that makes it possible to experience Nibbana. To put it more briefly, Atamayata is the state of mind which is not concocted, bound, or covered by anything. Nibbana is the, or Atamayata is the state of mind which is most free, which is completely free. And so through Atamayata, the mind can make contact with Nibbana. Another way to put it, rather metaphorically, is that Atamayata is personal freedom and that Nibbana is universal freedom. Nibbana is the universal <coughs> state of freedom that can be discovered by everyone. Just make the mind a Dhammayata and you will discover that universal Nibbana. Next question, what is worldly right view? 
to explain worldly right view or logia samatiti. It's easier to explain both the worldly and the transcendent levels together. To put it most simply, worldly right view is the view or understanding that is still where there is still self. There is still self, but this understanding knows how to deal with the self in the best possible way for Nibbana. So in worldly right understanding, there still is some self, but it can be dealt with in the best possible way for making progress towards Nibbana. In this is the kind of right view that is called sasawa, which means still mixed up with the asavas. The asavas are the, the eruptions of defilement, the outflows of defilement. As long as these still exist, there will be attachment and defilement. So this is the worldly right view, still mixed up with the asavas. Transcended right view or loguttara um, samaditi, the right understanding which is above and beyond the world. In this there is the thorough, complete, total understanding that everything is not self that there is no person, no individual, no heaven, no hell. This is the mind that is above all the worldly kinds of values and meanings. No worldly value or meaning has any influence or power <coughs> over this mind. So it's, so it's described as anasawa without asavas. This is the right view that is without asavas that has nothing to do with the asavas. So there are these two kinds of right view. To study them together is much more easily, easier, and you'll make better progress, so we mention them both together. Worldly right understanding that is mixed up with the asavas where there's still self. And then the transcendent right understanding that is without asavas, where everything is understood to be not self. To put it practically, worldly right understanding is for the sake of living in the world in the best possible way, without any problems and transcendent right understanding is for being above the world. Worldly right understanding lets you live in the world without problems. And transcendent right understanding frees one totally from the world. One is beyond the world in all respects. To make it even more simple, we can talk about the, the kind of peacefulness which is not ultimate, the peace which is not yet ultimate, which is still relative to this world, so relative peacefulness. And then there is the peacefulness which is ultimate, which is, un, which is beyond the world, which isn't relative or related to anything. It's totally free, totally peaceful. Worldly right understanding allows us to live peacefully in the world with relative peacefulness. And transcendent right understanding allows us to experience, to discover ultimate peacefulness or the 
non-relative peacefulness. The next question is the Buddha's first words on enlightenment were Aneka Chati Sang Sarang Santawi Sang Anipi Sang. We chant these words every day. How then can one deny some kind of rebirth, whatever intellectual difficulties we face with the concept of anatta? It seems that you have not understood the meaning of the word rebirth. Don't, don't always insist or assume that rebirth means to be reborn in the womb of a mother someplace. Many people speak only of physical, material rebirth. This is not what the Buddha was talking about. The Buddha's teachings are spiritual, not materialistic. So one must understand the word rebirth in a spiritual way rather than a materialistic way. Therefore, you should understand that what the, the meaning of what the Buddha was saying was that before my enlightenment, a lot of Atta got born in me. Atta kept being born over and over again before the enlightenment. But now that there is full enlightenment regarding life, regarding the Four Noble Truths, there's no more of this Atta being born in me. I've torn down and destroyed all the causes and conditions by which Atta can be reborn. So this is the kind of rebirth that the Buddha was talking about. The rebirth of self, of ego, of Atta through ignorance, desire, and attachment. We would never deny that there is such a rebirth. And this understanding of rebirth is not at all in conflict with anatta. Next question. I somewhat understand anatta and therefore the impossibility of a self-soul being reincarnated. But I feel it doesn't have to be a self that goes to a new life. It can be a momentum towards self established in ignorance. This tendency towards the self-concept may continue in universal mind and therefore create a new physical body. Do you think this could be so? <clears throat> it is possible. It's very possible that through all the many, many times that Atta, that the self-concept has been born in our minds, that this will develop a momentum that this momentum will be within what are called the anutsaya, the, the latent tendencies which are kind of stored in the substratum of the mind. Through the constant birth of the self-concept of atta, this tendency towards atta, towards self, develops and grows stronger and then has a certain momentum. So this is possible. However, it's all a merely a matter of itapajayata, the tendencies, 
the birth of the self-concept and so on are merely due to causes and conditions. They're, they happen because of the law of Itapajayata and therefore it is all anatta or not-self. So these tendencies build up in the subconscious or the substratum of the mind and develops a momentum. But both these, this tendency towards atta and this momentum, these are not self. They should never be taken to be self because they're just natures, just natural things happening according to the law of nature, the law of conditionality. And so it would be totally incorrect to consider them or to call them selves. They're just anatta or not self. As for this universal mind that you mention, in Buddhism there is no such thing as universal mind. In certain other religions, however, they have universal self or universal soul. But that is something that doesn't exist in Buddhism. In Buddhism, there is just eternal voidness. Other religions, such as the Hindus, have their universal self or their eternal self, eternal soul. But in Buddhism, there is only eternal voidness, the eternal voidness that is absolutely void of self. And so perhaps the questioner has confused this idea of universal self or eternal self and come up with the idea of universal mind. However, this is not a concept in Buddhism. Buddhism only speaks about universal or eternal voidness. To speak of universal mind, this is probably a transformation of the universal self of other religions. We, when we transform this universal self into universal mind. But there is no such thing as Buddhism because this universal mind will probably revert back to the universal self. So in Buddhism we have both universal and eternal, but it's the universal void, the eternal void rather than self. So earlier he said, I forgot to translate that. So you seem to have understood half of the matter and that's very, very good. Keep trying, keep working on it because there remains half of the matter which you have not yet understood. The next question. If someone attacks us mentally or physically, such as in physical assault or rape, under the law of impermanence, we know it will not last. But how can we stop ourselves from feeling anger, hatred, and bitterness, and pity for the people who hurt us? The way is to not have any self to be assaulted or raped. When there is no self to be victimized or attacked, then we will not have any of these problems. Of course, it's fine to feel pity for the fools who do such violent and stupid actions. To feel pity for them is one thing, but 
there's no need to have some me who had the who was victimized or experienced these things. So when one sees that there's just body and mind, but there's but it's not self, then these problems won't arise. To see that there's the body is just some external covering and that it's ordinary that all kinds of things will happen to the body. And then that the mind can be raised up above all such worldly things. Seeing in this way, there's no one to be assaulted, raped, or victimized. Do you have any comments on the quite recent killing of Thai monks in America? We don't really know what the facts of the case are, but as far as we know, it's all just e tapajayata, and it has no more meaning than that for us. Merely e tapajayata. Next question. A newborn knows nothing, and yet a baby may laugh at a toy rattle and cry if it is taken away. Buddhism would call this attachment, the self, but I regard it as nature, like a dog with a bone. Please explain. Whether talking about a dog and its bone or a baby and its rattle, it, they're both a matter of attachment. That the dog clings to its bone or the baby to its rattle, this is a matter of attachment. But it's only attachment or upadana on a, on a very basic level. But still, once there is attachment, then when one gets what one wants, one is glad, and when one loses it, one is sad. And so because of this attachment, both the baby and the dog must experience gladness and sadness. The next question, can you explain more about walking without a walker? Has it the same meaning as a self that is not self? Listen and figure out for yourself whether the two are the same. When there is walking with a walker, when there is the one who walks, then there is the desire to walk and there is the desire to arrive. And then there is the gladness and sadness of arriving or of meeting obstacles while walking. When there is walking without a walker, there is just the body and mind walking naturally without any concept or even a feeling of some me who is walking. Instead of the me or the walker, there is just mindfulness, correct understanding, and sampajanya, the, the immediate application of that understanding. So there is just walking. Everything is Dhamma. The mind, the body, everything is just Dhamma because of this Sati mindfulness and Panya wisdom. So there's no, no walker. So these are totally different. Walking with a walker and walking without a walker 
are totally different. One is walking with desire and detachment. The other is walking with mindfulness and wisdom. With one, the mind is still disturbed by positive and negative events. In the other, the mind is totally peaceful. The walking without a walker, there's just no way that there can be any dukkha. The mind is free. Now, regarding the self which is not self, that is one meaning. But this walking without a walker has the meaning of just the mind. There's just the mind with wisdom, which is not self. One is the self, which is not self. But now we're talking about the mind, which is not self. This is a way of practice. This is a lesson that for understanding anatta. This is the direct investigation of anatta. This is a lesson which makes it easy for us to understand anatta. And so there's, there is a difference between the self which is not self and walking without any self at all. Please extend the meaning of this till it becomes doing without a doer. Doing all the things we must do in, in life each day. Doing everything without any doer. Acting without an actor. Extend the meaning of this until it includes everything in life. So that everything is, it's just the five khandhas doing things, but there's no doer, no actor, just the five khandhas operating naturally according to the law of itapajayata, but it's all anatta or not-self. Please extend this meaning to one thoroughly understands anatta. If you're going to shoot your rifle at a target, if you're in a marksman's ship or a shooting contest, every time you shoot the gun, shoot without a shooter and you will win the prize every time. For every time we aim the gun and pull the trigger, there's no aimer, no puller, no shooter, then we will always win the prize. There is just the mind's intention to shoot the gun correctly, but there's no thought of the me who is shooting, the me who will shoot well or shoot poorly, no thoughts of winning or losing. There's just the intention to shoot the gun correctly. And then the mind controls the body in order to do so. If you can shoot the gun in this way, then you'll always take the first prize. The mind that acts through voidness, the mind that acts in voidness, and the mind that acts full of attachment, full of ego, are totally different. One should study this difference between the mind that is totally free and void of self and void of things belonging to self. And then the mind that is full of desire, attachment, in ego. The mind that acts through voidness will always do a much better job, will always be much more competent and efficient and successful than the mind that acts through self, through attachment. 
Now please don't worry about who will gain the benefits of these actions. The results of the actions will accrue, will fall to the, the one who did them. This is just the way things happen, the way they work. Whether acting with, through voidness or acting through attachments, the fruits and results of the actions will accrue to the, the one who, who did the actions. But the results will be much different when one acts with attachment. When one acts through voidness, then there is no complications, no busyness, no confusion. The mind is peaceful. And so the action is most efficient and successful. But when acting through attachment, things get complicated, confused, busy, stressful, and things aren't at all peaceful. So the results will always happen to whoever does the, the action. But the kind of results will differ according to how one acts. It's always wisest and best to act through voidness, to act without an actor. This, this, kind, this way of acting is what we call Buddhist art. The art of Buddhism is not the paintings and statues and all those things. The real art of Buddhism is the art of acting without self, of acting without attachment, the art of voidness. The next question is, do you believe that mindfulness is the only means by which we can liberate the mind? That is, are enlightened Buddhists the only truly wise and happy people in the world? <clears throat> Mindfulness or sati is not the one that brings about liberation. The, the agent that brings about liberation is not sati, but is panya, that is correct understanding or wisdom. Sati is what goes and brings the wisdom to the situation. Sati is aware of the situation and then retrieves panya or wisdom and then wisdom is the agent for liberation sati alone will never bring about liberation and the same is true about wisdom all the knowledge and understanding in the world is useless is wasted without mindfulness all the things we learn in university for example, are wasted without mindfulness. So don't separate the two. Do not separate mindfulness from wisdom. Mindfulness alone cannot free us from dukkha. Wisdom alone cannot free us from dukkha. For example, the person who's drunk, intoxicated, is an example of someone without mindfulness and they do all kinds of stupid, careless, clumsy things. No matter how wise or intelligent one is, without mindfulness one cannot solve the problem of dukkha. So do not separate them. Both are needed together for liberation. And even when we're not talking about Dhamma, when we just talk about ordinary worldly existence, 
we need both mindfulness and understanding. To do anything in this life, we need to both pay attention and then apply our knowledge and understanding. One without the other is never enough. So we cannot separate the two. But when speaking of Dhamma, don't speak of mindfulness as bringing about liberation. But it's mindfulness that retrieves the wisdom. And then the wisdom or panya is what brings about or makes liberation. Now you spoke of the enlightened Buddhists. Actually, the word Buddhist is redundant. But when we speak of enlightened beings, the term for this is the Arahant. The Arahants are those who have perfected mindfulness and wisdom. So that this perfected mindfulness and wisdom has ended all problems. The Arahant has no more burdens, no more problems, no more dukkha, and is free. And so the, Arah <coughs> the Arahant's attention can then be turned to the difficulties and problems of others. The Arahant can live for the sake of others, because the Arahant has no more self, is no longer obsessed, concerned with me. The Arahant can live for the sake and benefit of others. So the Arahant's life is the most useful kind of life because it is the Arahant has accomplished the highest personal benefit and purpose and then is also able to dedicate her or his life for the sake of others. So in short, sati or mindfulness is what the servant of wisdom. And then when mindfulness serves wisdom, then wisdom can function in order to solve our problems. Now, the implied understanding of this question is that mindfulness and wisdom are only available in Buddhism. Is this understanding correct? No, it's not correct. Outside of Buddhism, in other traditions and schools, there are there is mindfulness and there is understanding. But they're the mindfulness and understanding according to the other traditions. And whether it's correct or not, we cannot say. It's not for us to judge whether the mindfulness and understanding of other traditions is correct or not. All we can say that there is both samasati and michasati both right mindfulness and wrong mindfulness. There is samaditi and michaditi, both right view and wrong view. And there is not only right wisdom, but there is wrong understanding. And further, there is, there is the degree of mindfulness and wisdom. There can be a little bit of mindfulness or a lot. A little bit of wisdom or a lot. These things are not just a matter of Buddhism. In fact, just to live in this world, everyone needs mindfulness and wisdom. So. Even if we set aside religion and spiritual matters, one needs mindfulness and wisdom just to live. If you totally lacked mindfulness and understanding, you would have been dead long ago. But this ordinary 
mindfulness and wisdom the kind all of us are born with or that we learn from our parents through school. This isn't enough to solve our spiritual problems. It's good enough for physical survival, but it's not enough to make an end of dukkha. And so this ordinary mindfulness and wisdom must be trained until it has the ability to end all dukkha. And is it correct to think that that genuine true wisdom and happiness can only be found in Buddhism? In response to this, one needs to understand that the understanding of what dukkha is and the understanding of the way to end dukkha will depend on the different inclinations, experiences, and understanding of people. In short, different people will have different understandings of what dukkha is and about the way to make an end to dukkha. And so they will find ways to, to discover the end to dukkha according to their particular understanding of what dukkha is. So depending on what certain people or each person or group considers to be the problem, the solution to the problem will be according to that and will be within the context of their understanding of the problem. Now in Buddhism, when we look at, try to look at things from the most Dhammic perspective possible, we ask, or let's say, in Buddhism, the way we look at it is that dukkha comes from attachment that because of attachment to self, to me, there is dukkha. And so then that the way to end dukkha is to remove attachment, to eliminate attachment. So this is how we see the problem and its solution. Now if we look at it from the most neutral perspective, Dhammic perspective. We really have a Dhamma perspective. It's neutral, it's unbiased, it's natural. Then we must ask, what dukkha is there which is higher or more basic than the dukkha of attachment? What dukkha is there more significant than the dukkha of attachment? And then what quenching or ending of dukkha is more complete and more total than the removal and quenching of attachment? Now, please don't use this in order to compare different schools, sects, and religions. This is not at all our purpose. We're not trying to compare because that will just lead to atta and ataniya. If we compare, then there will just be, well, I am like this and my way is like this and this would just create more dukkha. Our goal is not to make any comparisons. Our goal is simply to eliminate all dukkha and therefore to eliminate, to quench all attachment. And from our understanding, 
the best way to do that is through the understanding of not-self. Now, if they don't have the wisdom or intelligence to understand this way of quenching dukkha, well, then they won't be able to apply it. They won't be able to use it. If their understanding is that dukkha comes from heavenly beings, from angels or whatever, or that dukkha comes from God, well, then they must solve their dukkha by praying or bribing or whatever these heavenly beings or God to take away the dukkha. If that's their understanding, then they must use the approach appropriate to that understanding. Or even on a more crude level, if they think that dukkha comes from spirits and and things, well, then they must give offerings and bribes to the spirits so that the spirits will not create any, any dukkha for them. So one shouldn't be asking which way is better because that can't be answered absolutely or unequivocally. One should just say which way is appropriate for whom. Which way of quenching dukkha is appropriate for each person? Which way of understanding is appropriate for our level of intelligence, for the the degree that our mindfulness and wisdom has been developed? Finally, so you have you have endured two hours of some a number of difficult Dhamma points. But one thing we'd like to mention that it is apparent from the questions that you have asked that your understanding of Dhamma is pretty good. That these questions show that you have understood a number of Dhamma points. That you have a pretty good understanding so far. And that if you keep studying, keep practicing, then your understanding will develop and grow even further. So we hope that you will carry on with what you have begun. Your understanding is all already quite good. And we hope that you will continue developing it until you are successful in solving all the problems in your life until you can eliminate all dukkha from life.